Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our third episode of uh, First Principles video series. Uh, today, we have uh, Nachiket uh, Patlapali, one of the security architects in OCI. He is here to, today to talk about uh, OCI's overall security posture. Welcome, Nachiket. Hi, Pradeep. Thanks for inviting me to chat about security, and I'm absolutely excited to be here to talk about how we think about and do security at OCI. Yeah, so to, you know, get, get us started. Uh, tell, tell us a little bit about you know, how we think about OCI security. As you know, being one of the early key architects of OCI, security has been a fundamental design principle for OCI. We've been thinking about security since day zero. And the way we built OCI was to enable our customers to run their most mission critical workloads with sensitive data on OCI. But then we took on another challenge too, which is, we want the customers to be able to run the mission critical workloads without having to become security subject matter experts. And let me use an analogy to explain how we did this. If you think about it, cloud security is a vast topic covering a lot of issues. An analogy we can use is, a, is an iceberg. So the visible part you see on the top are the security services and features we offer to the customer. And underneath the covers, we have a whole slew of activities we do, whether it's security operations or incident response or infrastructure compliance, operator access and so on, which are not visible to the customer, but essentially when customers are thinking about security of their workloads, they're thinking about the security of the whole iceberg. So if we look at the visible part, the way we are enabling customers to securely run their workloads uh, without having to worry about 100 different security knobs to configure and achieve the desired security posture is by offering simple and prescriptive security services. That's been one of the fundamental design tenets in our security services is how do we make it easy and prescriptive for customers to just get the security posture they need. And another thing we've been stressing and we actually enforce as a tenant is integrating security across all our services. Let's take an example of encryption, encryption of data at rest. It's a fundamental requirement of every OCI service to support encryption of data at rest with KMS, with the key management service. Services don't get to choose whether they encrypt data or not, they have to. So these are like some ways where we make security simple and prescriptive for, for customers. And now if you go to the part under the covers, the part which is not visible to the customers, we are continuously making investments in this on raising the security bar of our infrastructure. And all the investments are guided by two fundamental security principles. The first is defense in depth, which is continuously integrating security controls in all layers of the infrastructure stack, like that, uh, whether it's physical security or whether it's OS security or hyperware security and so on. And the second principle is blast radius reduction. And all of us have done security at scale. And one of the things we have learned over years is security issues do happen, but the main thing is how do we contain them the smallest area possible. And that's essentially blast radius reduction. So this is how we actually think about and do security at OCI. And, and again, as I said, one of the main design goals we want to enable is customers should not only be able to run the mission critical workloads in OCI, but they do not require to become some security subject matter experts. experts. Awesome. Hey, so we talk about, you know, the Gen 1 cloud, Gen 2 cloud, and we essentially are, you know, one of the Gen 2 clouds and our security posture is different. Can you give some examples of where we are concretely different? Absolutely. So uh, let me just set a bit of a context on the Gen 1 versus Gen 2, and I'll, I'll get, get to the specifics of the answer. So traditionally, the Gen 1 clouds have been built with the hypervisor architecture in mind. Since we all know that hypervisors are extremely good at virtualizing server resources and managing VMs, whether it's kicking up VMs, stopping VMs, resuming VMs, and so on. But when you operate a cloud, there are also a whole slew of control plane operations, which need to do a lot of behind the scenes management. And in Gen 1 Cloud, a design decision was made to integrate all this privileged control plane functionality into the hypervisor. As from an implementation perspective, it's an easy choice. But from a security perspective, this is not such a good option. And, and, the, and why is that? It goes back to the blast radius I just talked about in the, previous, in the previous answer, which is any security issue in the hypervisor now not only impacts the VMs on that host, but an attacker could potentially impact VMs running on other hosts 
or even pivot into the control plane and do a lot more damage. So when we looked at that, it was an unacceptable design choice for us. We wanted to do something better for our customers. And the way we uh, answered that question is by taking the control plane functionality completely out of the hypervisor and run it separately on a separate processor and as, which we call as our box virtualization hardware. And the immediate security benefit of this was again, highly reducing the blast radius. Now we are back to a good place where if there's a security issue in the hypervisor, it impacts only the VMs on that host and nothing else. And this is one of the fundamental ways in which we architected OCI. And essentially, again, as you being one of the key architects, you know that one of the fundamental design principles we used was the bare metal architecture. How do we run bare metal instances in OCI? And our answer to, do, to doing that was deprivilege the hypervisor, run all the control plane code in a privileged uh, hardware, which is our box virtualization. And this forms like the core, um, what should I say, building block of security in, in OCI. And this is how our Gen 2 security differs from uh, stat, status quo Gen 1 security. Got it. So you're essentially saying, you know, in the Gen 2, we essentially ignore the hypervisor as the main security construct, if you will. Uh, we don't exactly. trust that anymore. We essentially move the trust boundary outside. And, yep. you know, that essentially enables us to do bare metal, but it, it fundamentally improves the security posture for all our compute infrastructure, including VMs. Is that what I heard? Exactly, exactly, yes. Yeah, so uh, tell, tell me a little bit more about, you know, how do we enable bare metal uh, instances in, in OCI? Absolutely, so, so there's one more piece of this puzzle, which I didn't mention, which is root of trust hardware. So, so these are two things which we are going to talk in this chat today. One is the security benefits of off-box virtualization, and then more importantly, the root of trust hardware. So let's go back to the bare metal architecture. I mean, our customers were absolutely delighted with this, right? When we offered bare metal instances where there's no Oracle managed code, customers get the complete physical server on which they have flexibility to run any application they want, install any OS or hypervisor they want, and even to firmware. I mean, we've had cases where customers came and said, I need to be able to run some specific version of firmware on my SSD or a specific version of uh, like do firmware settings for SRIOV on the next. So we had all these requirements. And when we offered bare metal instances, obviously customers were beyond delighted. But the thing is from a security perspective, we also had to think about what are the security risks of this bare metal architecture. And one of the things which came up was firmware security. Means there's a lot of firmware in any server, whether it's the BIOS, where it's firmware running on the NIC, firmware running in the GPU, firmware running in uh, the SSD drives. All this firmware can be subverted if they are under the complete control of the customer, especially a malicious one. So we had to think about how do we offer this bare metal architecture, but at the same time, make sure we raise the bar on firmware security. So one of the questions we had to tackle then was people did ask us, Firmware security seems such an esoteric topic, like do we even need to worry about it and make investments to raise the bar on firmware security? And again, we took a long, long view on this one. Our whole idea was we need to look beyond the corner and see what security issues are emerging and, be, and make design choices to address them. And so we decided that you know, firmware security is an emerging problem and we need to uh, build defenses into our architecture. And the, and the answer for doing that is root of trust hardware. So let me give a little bit more context on how root of trust uh, hardware achieves the firmware security. So normally when you think about a server, as soon as the server is powered on, the BIOS comes up, configures the server, hands it on to the OS and hypervisor, and then it goes on to the applications. So if you, if you think about the security analogy of it's turtles all the way down, which is a very popular security analogy. Essentially, BIOS is the bottommost turtle. It's actually setting up the platform in a secure configuration beyond other things and then handing off control to the OS. And in firmware security attacks, we are talking about people going and subverting the BIOS. And, and one of the interesting facts is when a BIOS is upgraded, routines in the BIOS themselves are used to upgrade it. So then it came to the security conundrum as in, if we don't trust the BIOS, how do we go and do a clean install of a known good image of BIOS? And our answer was, go back to the security analogy of turtles all the way down, 
and create our own trusted security turtle, which is the root of trust hardware. This is a custom hardware designed by Oracle with custom firmware running on it. And what happens is when a, when a server is powered on, the root of trust hardware is the first piece of hardware which powers up and the root of trust hardware installs a known good image of the ILM or BMC firmware and which in turn installs a known good piece, uh, known good firmware image for the BIOS and which in turn installs known good firmware images for other components like NIC, um, uh, SSDs, GPU and so on. If you see like there's this chain of trust which flows starting from a trusted component, which is the root of trust hardware. And another cool thing about root of trust hardware is this whole process is automated. It means we build cloud services and we, and we made this into a service where the root of trust hardware is connected using an out of band network to a control plane. So anytime a server is given back by the customer, we kick this automated process, which in turn triggers the root of trust hardware and then and does a clean install of firmware. All the uh, important pieces of firmware on the server, as I said, BMC, BIOS, NIC, GPU, and so on. So there were a few things here. We took a long view to security. We made the investments necessary in terms of root of trust um, hardware, all for the sake of ensuring that our customer workloads are secure against any emerging security issues. And this is how root of trust enables uh, security of the bare metal platform in fact, is a key part of our whole security strategy. Got it. So essentially, you're, you're talking about, you know, in order to enable bare metal, you know, we use two key, key building blocks. There's an off-box virtualization device, and then there's a, this root of trust hardware uh, equipment that we actually design. Uh, does that essentially mean, you know, in, in a bare metal instance, a customer or an attacker, you know, can, you, can write whatever they want in the firmware and maybe even, you know, uh, uh, maybe even try to attack us, but then you know, as part of the uh, as part of the root of trust mechanism, we actually go clean that up. Is that what what I heard? Customers can write anything into the firmware. The root of trust hardware makes sure that it's reliably cleaned up, and we install known good images of firmware when the server is given back to us. So now, to your other question, you mentioned about hey, what happens when someone writes something something into the firmware? So the thing is at this point, this issue impacts bare metal instances, which are single tenant. So it's essentially limited to the, so the customer is responsible for the actions they are doing on the bare metal. So it impacts only the customer. And in fact, if you think about our infrastructure, and again, as I said, if you go back to the iceberg analogy, there are a lot of other companies. So we have a big security monitoring component in our control plane. And if ever we see any anomalous indicators, then we can take corrective action. So, so, so that's how we, again, manage the security risk of something happening in the root of trust hardware, which could potentially impact us. So I just want to keep make that clean. So two, two things, bare metal instances are single tenant. So customers are responsible for actions which happen on the bare metal instances. And to your question, is there any impact on us if like firmware malware impacts a bare metal customer? We have a whole set of other compensating security controls to monitor and remediate anything along those lines. So it doesn't impact Got it. us. Got it. So this whole firmware attack, you know, is that actually real? Is Have you actually seen that in real world? Yeah, that's a great question, Pradeep. And in fact, we've got that question from a lot of like people. So in fact, in 2019, there was, there was this form, there's a form called Eclipsium in, in United States. And in fact, Eclipsium was started by people I used to work with at Intel and they specialize in firmware exploits. And they demonstrated an exploit in 2019 where they were actually, I won't name the cloud provider, but they were able to get a server from a cloud provider, implant a firmware malware, give the server back to the cloud provider, get it back again, and then show that existence of their malware. And when this thing uh, issue came up in 2019 um, by Eclipsium, we, all we could say was, hey, this issue does not impact because we foresaw issues like this and then took care of them using you know, security mechanisms and it didn't impact us. So to answer your question, yes, firmware attacks are real. We have seen them in practice. People have demonstrated them against cloud providers and we are immune against those because of this root of trust hardware. Got it. So essentially we have, you know, there have been 
attacks or our demonstrations of our attacks, if you will, against cloud providers to be noted, not Oracle, some other cloud providers there, you know, in their bare metal compute instances, they have been able to install, you know, uh, persistent threats using former persistence. Is that correct? Yes, exactly. Yeah, cool. Well, that, that's good to know. The good, good to know that Oracle and OCI, we don't have that issue on our bare metal instances. So overall, you know, it looks like, you know, we, we essentially took a fundamentally different approach to security. And, you know, some of the examples where, you know, the way we approached our virtualization, where we fundamentally did not want to, you know, rely on hypervisors uh, for the core of our security, we essentially moved all of that to an off-box virtualization device. And, you know, we also, you know, moved the route of trust for actually erasing or securing our compute instance to a off, you know, off-box device, which is a custom hardware that we designed. Uh, is that essentially a good summary? Yeah, I think I think that, I think you put it well. So the things I would just highlight uh, is, so I want to emphasize the long view to security we took. So when we were thinking about this, so we could have taken an easy route and made decisions which were easy with respect to implementation. But we took a long view to security, and our goal has been, we will do the security lift on behalf of the customers. So customers can run their workloads without having to worry about security too much or become security subject matter experts. And these two um, uh, features we talked about, whether it's root of trust hardware, which is a custom piece of hardware, or the outbox virtualization, which is another piece of hardware with our proprietary code running on it, which is deployed across all the servers in OCI, are two very concrete, concrete demonstrations of how we did the heavy lift on behalf of the customer, so customers don't need to worry about security. But again, as I said, I would always go back to that analogy of the iceberg. There's a lot more things which go into the security of the whole OCI, and it would be great. And I look forward to having future chats where we start talking about other details in this iceberg and how we help customers achieve the security posture they need for the mission critical workloads in OCI. That's awesome. Thank you, Nachiket, for joining us today. Thank you, Pradeep.